Mischievous elements are plotting to cause disaffection among Bola Tinubu, Abdullahi Ganduje, and Ibrahim Masari, says the Kanu state government as they react to a leaked audio of Ibrahim Masari, a former placeholder and vice presidential candidate of the APC. And stakeholders reiterate need for original autonomy as the only solution to Nigeria's problems. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anako. Ibrahim Masari, a former placeholder vice presidential candidate of the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC, has said President-elect Bola Tinubu is making it difficult for people to trust him. He said this in a leaked phone call he had with the governor, uh, Abdullahi Ganduje of uh, Kanu State, over the meeting uh, Tinubu held with Rabiu Kwankoso, presidential candidate of the New Nigerian People's Party, NNPP. Now, in the audio, Masari has uh, was heard advising Ganduje to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the president-elect, but Ganduje, a strong backer of Tinubu, kept lamenting that he had been betrayed. The former uh, placeholder vice presidential candidate said Tinubu was sending the wrong signal that would prevent people from trusting him. Meanwhile, the Kanu state government has reacted to the audio of the phone call between the governor, Abdullahi Ganduji, and Ibrahim Masari, a former vice presidential candidate placeholder of the APC. In a statement, um, also, Malam Mohamed Garba, Commissioner for Information and Internal Affairs in Kanu state, said the exaggerated publicity on the purported audio clip was the handiwork of paid agents trying to unturn the so-called conversation with a view of causing disaffection between the two political gladiators. Joining us to discuss this is Shehu Musa Gabam. He's the national chairman of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, and Shegun Shopita, who is a public affairs analyst and is also of ACT Network. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us, and good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I'll start with you, Mr. Garbam, as a politician. This obviously doesn't come to you as a surprise. We've had so many leaked phone calls. Um, most of the time, what people are waiting to hear if, is if this audio was authentic or not. But from what the spokesperson of the Kanu state government has said, it sounds more like it was authentic, authentic but then the words were twisted um, in favor of the people who he would call uh, detractors of the governor of his state and, of course, uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. What are your thoughts on um, the content of this conversation? Well, first and foremost, uh, we are in an era of leakages, you know, where a lot of um, information had been leaked. But then to the authenticity of the, of the audio, uh, it's difficult for anybody to ascertain it. It takes an expert to say this is authentic or this was state managed. Number two, the issue of the placeholder is an academic thing for now because uh, uh, he was there on temporary grounds. He was replaced and he admitted to it. I'm sure he must have signed the documents of uh, replacement based on INEC uh, guidelines. For you to be substituted, you must have signed a letter of resignation not to participate anymore. So uh, I'm not in APC. I'm not speaking for APC, but knowing the power structure and the compositions of power, uh, some of these things are going to be tougher because some of the strong elements that are around the president-elect are doing everything only possible to have their way. And those who have contributed either directly or through proxies are also fighting very hard to make sure they are part of the system. Formation of government is extremely very difficult. And then it takes a strong leadership to look at the entire scenario you know, uh, critically and come up with processes that would define their sense of direction. For now, given the fixations of power and uh, the, the, the complex nature of judicial politicians around the president-elect, you don't expect it to be easy. Because people are negotiating for, for a lot of things. And if the president is not being careful, if he's being carried away, he will end up from the one having a cabinet that cannot fly. Uh, just the way we are having this current uh, outgoing government. I, I, I expect 
the president elect to go outside the box and look for people with capacity that will help him to be on his feet from the day of swearing in. But if he goes by the tradition of what APC government have done, President Mahmoud Buhari, it is extremely difficult for, for President Bola Tinimbu to, to take off from, from the ground. It's going to be extremely very complicated given the, the, the vicious nature of the people around him who wants to be around the cabinet at all costs and then continue the business as usual. So I expect uh, the president uh, to understand that the elections are over. It is time to govern Nigeria. And governing Nigeria need people with capacity, with a commitment, with national interest to, to change the narrative that we are having now, to deal with the insecurity, deal with a lot of uh, segregations, agitations, just like we have Shagari regime. You have to remodel the Shagari regime and make sure that people have a sense of belonging, sense of participation, so that there will be quietness in the land and people will begin to embrace a new leadership that have a vision of moving Nigeria forward. So it is normal. Some of these things, you will see worse of it. You will see more of leakage. You will see a lot of gossip. You will see a lot of attempt to drain the process. But I believe that as a nation, we will not allow it to happen because the May 29th is sacrosanct by law. And then whatever happens, somebody must be sworn in. Uh, for now, it is the president because there's no any uh, judgment that set that aside. And once he's been sworn in, uh, he need to do the needful that he need to keep the ground running. And then we wait for the final judgment of the of the cost of the land. Let me move to you, Shegun. Um Looking at um, the situation between uh, what happened during the elections, of course, we saw how um, Kanu was swept by the NNPP, knowing obviously also that um, um, Kwankoso does have a hold of sorts um, in Kanu. Um, and the meeting that the president elect did have with the NNPP presidential candidate, um, how do you think um, the Kanu state government is taking it again? Um, with all of the deals that have been made publicly or privately, how easy is it going to be for those who think that they have supported the president-elect within the party? And, of course, the strides that he's making with those who are outside of the party. Well, um, look, this is what politicians do. They do deals. They host trade. Um, they seek support from each other in exchange for something or the other. And uh, what we are seeing playing out in Kano you know, is not is not particularly different from what you would normally see, you know, from politicians. Um, the reaction of the Kano State Governor and the APC in Kano State maybe um, is not surprising, you know, because if the president elect is having meetings with a member of another party, especially a party who more or less is now in control of Kano State, then of course the 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 the, the APC uh, people in Kano State should be worried. For example, what does that mean for them? Um, consti constitutionally, the president elect must pick appointees into his cabinet and into his government from all the thirty six states of the federation. Must have at least one minister from Kano State. What that meeting with Kwan uh, Kwan So uh, means for the APC is that there is a strong possibility that the person that will represent Kano State um, in, in the president-elect's cabinet will not be appointed by the APC, will not be recommended by the APC, which is a loss of ground and a loss of power. You know, so that would explain why they're, they're worried. And of course, that would trickle down to other appointments that the president-elect will be making that you know might um, have come uh, as recommendations from the APC. It, it, it would mean that the APC has lost ground to Kwan Kwan So in Kano, not just with the elections, but even within the political calculations within that state. So yes, the APC there should complain. They should be worried. Uh, for us as Nigerians, what does this mean? Um, you know, for me as a good governance advocate, it's neither here nor there. This is politicians doing what they will do. Um, I'm not under any illusion. As, as an ordinary Nigerian, or as a Nigerian that speaks for the ordinary Nigerian, uh, that all of this uh, horse trading and negotiations is, has anything to do with good governance 
has anything to do with the interest of the of 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 the larger population. Um, if anybody's interest is being served by all of this, it's the interest of the people with the influence, the people in the political circles in that area, and, and that's about it. So for us, we just watch with with uh, you know some measure of attention, just so that we're informed and we know what's happening and we know where our appointees will be coming from and how they came about, and, and that's just about it. Uh, one of the other things that I think this should say to political watchers is it will be interesting to see how the president-elect navigates uh, you know, this, 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 this situation. We know his politics from Lagos, you know, but now he's moving to the national level, and he, even he will find that uh, dealing with the political calculations, the political schemes, um, is a completely different different ball game now that he's doing it at the national level as against what he was doing in Lagos. He cannot just appoint people single-handedly the way he used to do. Um, he has to be more broad-minded and broad-based in his approach. Um, and maybe, maybe this is a testament to the fact that he's willing to do this, the fact that he's willing to talk to NMPP rather than just his own party. Maybe it means that he's willing to step on toes a bit in order to ensure that um, some measure of national unity is sustained. We will see. Uh, I'm not saying that's what it is, but it could be. You know, so it's all very interesting just for those of us that um, are political observers. Uh, back, back to you, Mr. Gabam. Um, it's interesting um, how everybody's talking about the meeting with Kwanko. So we've seen, um, you know, Governor Wike. We've seen uh, the governor of your state, uh, Governor elect, who's also sitting governor, um, you know, meet with Tina. But this is not the first time that people who are outside of the APC have met with the president elect. But then Kwanko So's meeting seems to be raising dust in Kanu State. Uh, the PDP, as it two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, was setting, uh, getting set to um, re uh, award the likes of Governor Wiki and Governor Makinde as outgoing governors for not just what they've done in their states, but also in the party. So uh, what would be the fear that you presume the people in Kano would have um, over these talks with Ekwankwa? So being that he also had eyed this coveted seat, which is the presidency, uh, and now, of course, he's lost out. Um, the likes of Reno Mokri is wondering um, also why Tinubu would be hobnobbing with Ekwankwa so, and what exactly he'd be needing from him. Well, if you study the body language of the of Concoso, even before the election, uh, it suggests clearly that uh, he has a sort of sympathy given the long-standing relationship between himself and Bola Ahmed Chinumbu. Uh, during the SDP days of Babiola, uh, Concoso was a deputy speaker under SDP, while Bola was a senator elect from Lagos under SDP. So they've been friends for, for a long time, politically. And then, of course, you know, that friendship have outdates his relationship with uh, Ganduji. Mm. And then in, in trying to form a political alliance to move the country forward, you have to look for forces that will balance possibility of crisis, you know, around the political zones. Who are those who have the muzzle that can water down possibility of conflict or crisis around the country? That That's how visionary leaders look into issues. They don't just pick anybody, but the people that will add value in terms of, you know, upgrading the quality of the leadership. So it, it's not a surprising thing for those who know the history of the relationship between them. And of course, if you also followed the, the interview conducted with Concourse so before the election, he certainly gave advantage to Bola than Achiko. You know, so there's that linkage between them for, for a very long time. There have been effort to, you know, convince Konko Soden to come out publicly and support Bola and step down his ambition. He refused. He said he would take it to the end. And now, of course, the, the, the election have come to an end. So they are renewing their political relationship. It is likely uh, that Bola is looking at the political weight of Konko so and what value is going to add to, to his government, and given the size of Kano, the economic importance of Kano, uh, it is going to be strategic advantageous to him than perhaps what the outgoing governor is going to give. Don't also forget the fact that the outgoing governor has his own hitches at home domestically that was generated, uh, that is into a multifaceted, uh, that, that issues, 
that is also generating a lot of negative reaction in terms of supporting him, in terms of his uh, home-based support. So it, it's, it's a multifaceted thing. And for, for the president-elect to have some level of stability, given the, 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 the results that have been declared by INEC, and in a country where you have over 90 million registered voters, we end up having 8.7 million to produce a president. It's a Herculean tax for any serious leader to look into in terms of forming cabinet and stabilizing the country. If there will be a lot of challenges, tremendous challenges. Like I've said, some of the people around him are very vicious, are very furious in terms of fighting hard to make sure they get a position. And then if you give them the position, you have not done your mathematics very well, you will not get the formula right. And then the ball stopped at his own desk. So mm -hmm. knowing the, the president-elect that I know with level of independent of his mindset in terms of dissecting issues, there's a possibility we will go off the course, not to what people are thinking about. He will go for quality people that are going to add value to the government because already is 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 from behind, given the result of the elections, the agitation, the fracas around the system. He need to do something. He need to get people that have capacity to muzzle people together and pacify the system uh, for for a proper takeoff. Mm. Um, there seems to also be in the tone between the, com the conversation between the two gentlemen, the governor and, of course, the placeholder. There seems to be that tone of sadness, of abandonment. Could this be the general feeling from the people in the North being that the North um, had um, boldly come out to say they supported him? And I'm not talking about the North. I'm talking about the governors who supported him. Uh, you know, his emergence and those who have continuously stood by him uh, all through the elections. Could this be the same um, disaffection that is resonating across um, the northern uh, supports that um, Bola Ahmed Tinubu enjoyed during his campaign? Well, I, I, I really don't think so because the people are in a hurry to make assertions. First, the cabinet lists are not out. So people are just speculating. Those that, are, those that have pressed the desperate uh, button, thinking by now maybe the president-elect would have released the, the list of his possible upcoming cabinet, have not seen that. Speculations are ongoing, maybe uh, rightly or wrongly, some fake lists are going around. And that is creating the agitation, that is creating the fear that maybe the, the president-elect cannot stand by what he said. If there's any private agreement between him and the so-called placeholder before, but I think the timing is wrong for to start heating up the system. The, the, the need for the placeholder to understand that he needs to wait and see how the cabinet will go. But mm. I don't know what agreements are in between them, what position he have bargained for or they have bargained for him. But it is necessary for people to exercise patience, for us to have a peaceful transition, and for the president-elect to determine the kind of people he's going to work with. Mm. You know, experience has shown us that the current people that are running the country lack the capacity to run the country. And if you repeat the same kind of mistake by electing very weak people to preside over his cabinet, certainly Nigeria will be in for a disaster. Because mm. globally, we are having economic recession all over the world. Our economy is down. It's on its knees. And then you need people with creativity, with economic skill and expertise, with political skill, you know, to bring the country together, create political environment for investment and otherwise coming. So for me, I would advise the president-elect to be extremely very careful in his decision. We have said it severally. In, in anything short of being extremely careful and very technical and very uh, deep in his assessment of the quality of people he's bringing in, certainly he's going for for a very nasty situation to deal with. Mm. The poverty level is extremely very high. You know, the unemployment is unimaginable. Our health sector have gone on its knees. The educational sector have gone on its knees. So all the vital organs, the fundamental pillars that are supposed to drive the nation to stability are very weak. The National Assembly is trying to come on board. They have crisis to manage the National Assembly, the leadership of the National Assembly already. So from all fronts, he's been confronted with a lot of challenges. So he needs people 
that have the right thinking, the right stability to do that. Okay, I'll come back to you because there are a few things you've raised and I, I want to, you know, just push you further on it. But let me come back to Shegun. Um, Shegun, how trustworthy is Ebola met Tinubu? Because you see, uh, Mr. Gabam here keeps saying that, oh, yes, of course, the deals that were made or whatever, you know, they, people need to be patient. He's, he sounds more like... He trusts what you know, Ebola met to may be able to deliver upon. But how trustworthy is he? Because again, in the tone of that conversation, even though we've not been able to ascertain the veracity or the you know authenticity of that uh, particular conversation, even though the, nobody has also said it didn't happen, um, I'm wondering. Um, does it not seem like the people are questioning if he is a man of his word? And for you, who's experienced him as a politician, as the governor of Lagos State, et cetera, et cetera, how trustworthy is Ebola Ahmed Tinubu in terms of a man who can keep his word? Well, um, <clears throat> that's a difficult question to answer, and it depends on what angle you're looking for. So you put me on the spot a bit. <laughs> uh, well, well, uh, well, he's a politician. He's a man who wants yeah. his canvas to be president of this country. He said it's his turn. He's been a kingmaker. It's time for him to be the king. He's given us a project hope to look forward to. But how trustworthy is he in terms of delivering? Yeah, so, so the thing that we must recognize first and foremost is that um, the man, Tinubu, is very ambitious. Uh, we know this about him. Um, he's a long-term planner type of person. You know? So some people would describe that as being visionary. Um, but I, I have a different definition of being a visionary. So well, he definitely looks at the long term when he's making his calculations, his political calculations. Some will say he's a political strategist and a master politician. Um, they've used a lot of appellations for him um, that are positive. But we also have to remember, you know, from history and from his antecedents in Lagos and in southwestern politics that um, there have been situations where he's been accused of betraying the people that he that you know that worked for him and that he was in bed with. And you will remember vividly, um, for some people will remember vividly what happened, you know, in um, uh, 1999, in 2003, specifically, where um, the AD, as at that time lost almost the entirety of the Southwest as a result of a, a, a deal that Tinubu went into with the opposition, you know, with, with the election of um, a president, the deal where they went into a deal to say, um, we're going to vote for the president who is of a different party, but will vote for our governors, you know, at the gubernatorial elections. And it backfired. And the AD lost the entirety of, um, of Southwest, except for Lagos, where he was in control. You know, so we've seen uh, that the man can look at the political calculations independent of loyalties to the people he, one might have expected him to stay loyal to. You know, so, uh, for example, him going into bed with Kwan Kwan So, um, who pretty much is... Um, as of now, um, almost a mortal enemy of, of the APC hierarchy in Kano, you know, will definitely be seen as a betrayal by the Kano, you know, by Ganduje in particular, and the other, you know, the other APC um, um, hierarchy in Kano, you know. So how trustworthy is he when it comes to politics? I'm sorry, I think that the man will do what, number one, is in his best interests from a political point of view, and secondly, what is in the best interest of his party and his loyalists before any other consideration? You know, so uh, I, I, if I were the people that were in, in bed with him now, I would remember the different instances in the past where he may have been said to have betrayed certain people. We remember what happened with Ambody as an example also, you know, after even um, um, uh, Fashola... You remember, look, people that are political observers would know that whatever romance that is going on between Fashola today and Tinubu is, is, a, is, a, is a recent development. There was a time that they were really, really at daggers drawn at the beginning of the Buhari administration over the fact that the man Tinubu did not want a second time for Fashola. He was willing to discard him, and he did discard somebody. You know, so when it comes to political um, strategy and calculations, Tinubu is brutal. Tinubu will be 
um, um, as, as uh, uh, well, yeah, let me just use the word brutal, as necessary in his view. And he will not look at certain considerations that somebody might have said, oh, you need to be loyal, you need to be honorable, and all of that. Those considerations may come secondary to him, you know, if he feels that his political interest would be better served by working with somebody else. You know, so if I were the people working with him, I, I wouldn't close my two eyes. I would, I would be looking, you know, over my shoulders once in a while just to be sure that I'm safe. Quickly, before I go back to Mr. Gabon, um, st still talking about, you know, in your words, him being brutal here. Do we see a lot of um, ethnic and um, religious sentiments coming to play, especially with the picking of people who he would be working with in the long run? Well, um, I think by and large, the man has shown himself to be largely tribalized and um, maybe not particular about what religion you practice. We can look at the different appointments that he's had, his closest political allies and all of that, and you see that it's very broad-based. You know, you have pastors, you have Christians, you have Muslims, you have northerners. You can see the way the north has rallied behind him. Um, you have southerners, you know, and all of that. So um, I'm not sure that we need to worry about his cabinet, for example, being particularly um, tribalistic or maybe skilled towards a particular religion. Of course, because he's a man from the southwest, a Yoruba man, who grew up in the southwest, you are likely to see that there will be a, a slight tilt in that direction in his appointment. But I don't think that it would be too, um, it would be unbalanced. The way, for example, that people have complained about, you know, the outgoing president's appointment. I don't think we'll see that kind of skewed, skewedness. Okay. Back to you, Shay. You, you talked about something, um, you kept talking about quality people. Um, that you, you're, you're asking that the president-elect the president look in that direction of getting people of quality. What quality exactly do you speak of here? Because I remember um, six months down the la six months into President Buhari's administration, we were yet to see a list of people um, who he was um, you know, going to make his ministers. And he kept saying that the delay was because he was looking for men and women who were upstanding, uh, rather right, um, upright, I beg your pardon, men who were, um, you know, decent, those who did not have any skeletons in their cupboard. But here we are at the close of his government. Can we really say that six months was what's the way to again? Um, what is the quality that you speak of in terms of the people that Bola Ahmed Tinubu should be um, focusing his attention on? First, um, I believe President Buhari did not believe he was going to win the election. That what led to the delay in the formation of his government. There's no any president that is prepared to take over power that would wait six, seven months before forming the government. Nigeria have a surplus of some of the best friends you can find anywhere. If you are a serious president, you, you will have access to them at any time. Secondly, let me also remind you that if you look at of recent, even the administration of President Babangida, you will remember some of the best friends that have run the government. Forget about whatever happened politically, but he produced some of the best friends. If you look at also President Obasanjo, he tried and shot for some quality people that, were, that, 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 that helped him in driving his own, his own government. So uh, President Muhammad Buhari had a delay because they are not sure of they are going to win the election. So there was no plan of takeoff immediately. And that one led us into this mess economically, politically, and otherwise. So when it comes to the president elect, and given the history of what happened, you know, you know, under uh, Ubasanjo, under Yaradua, under Jonathan and Buhari himself, I think you have a sufficient lesson to learn and do the needful. And in every state of the Federation, I can bet you I've been to every state of Nigeria, in every state of the Federation, you will, best, you will get the best 20 quality people that will give you what you want. So it's a matter of making you a choice preparing for what you do, and committed to what you want to achieve. He will get the best people he's looking for in every set of federation, except if he's not ready to govern. Except if he's not ready to govern. Nigeria has surplus of some of the best you can think of. So for me, if you, if you experience any problem in the formation of cabinet of President Bola Ahmed Tunubu, it means he's not ready for it. Mm. Not because there's a shortfall of capacity to show for quality of people that can help him in driving the, 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 the government. 
So I strongly believe in that. And also, I, I, I strongly believe he will try as much as possible to be a national leader, devoid of being ethnic or religious sentiments. Because history has proved over a time that he has some level of balanced mind. Okay. You know, not the way we, we saw some government, I mean, this present government, you know, all the appointment towards one particular section of the country. I do not expect that. Like I've said, apart from, I'm not speaking for APC, somebody that I know one-on-one, -on -one, I've interfaced with him, I've interrogated some of his thinking and his capacity to, to, to look at issues. So we are, we are wishing the system well. The elections are over. We are looking forward to peaceful Nigeria, peaceful coexistence, economic prosperity, unity, conducive political environment for the country to move on. This is our prayer. We will not pray anything bad for to happen to our country under any circumstances. Mm. Uh, does it seem like um, there's trouble ahead um, after May 29 for uh, um, President-elect Tinubu, Bolomet Tinubu again? Because these are all, we're all speculating for you. You're hoping, you're praying that he's listening and that this might be his intention. And But then when we look at everything that has played out up until his election and, of course, where we are today, does it seem that it was, it's going to be an easy road for him, an easy journey ahead of him, a task? Again, um, there's so many things on his plate. We have an economy that is almost, in fact, we're facing a downturn. We're looking at a petroleum sector that is in tatters. Um, earlier today, the all of them across party lines were here in Lagos celebrating, um, you know, the Dangote refinery. But then we have Moribond, um, you know, refineries um, getting turned around maintenance every now and again, but we're not producing anything. I mean, talk about security. Talk about, I mean, there's so many things that lie ahead of the Bola Ahmed Tinubu administration. How easy is it going to be for him? I have no doubt in my mind he's going to inherit a very precarious situation. I have no doubt in my mind. The economy is very weak. There's lack of capacity to drive the economy. The political environment is polluted by politicians who don't believe in anything good, who don't want to see the country peaceful. And then, of course, above all, uh, you, you have already security crisis at heart, you know, that is taking the life of innocent people, wiping out villages, actually or weekly or daily basis. These are fundamental issues that he need to deal with straight ahead. If he is not decisive, I don't see him having a stable government. He must be very decisive. There must be deterrence. If he lacks capacity to create deterrence, then there's no hope for him. Deterrence is fundamental for him to succeed. Those that are part of the killing and the maiming and the raping and the production of offers must pay for it, must be prosecuted. Those that are responsible for economic sabotage must pay for it. The, the, the central bank that have ruined our economy, that have commercialized our economy, have hijacked the public fund, must be investigated. All things that, that led us to where we are must be investigated. That is the only way you can create the tariff and people will have a hope that there's a better future. But if he's coming in, okay, it's business as usual. I'm sorry for him. I sympathize with him. Because study administration after administration, and participating in the electoral process over decades. I know that anybody who is going to be the president of Nigeria, and he lacks the will to take tough decisions, I'm sorry for him, it's not going to be it. I sympathize with him, he's going to inherit tremendous problems, very deep challenges, particularly from the security angle, from the political angle, and from ministries, strategic ministries, that have to change the life of Nigerians. Anything short of bringing the best, then is, is a big issue that we have to face as a nation. Finally, um, Shogun, because we're out of time, <laughs> for those of you who are into good governance and advocacies that um, have been on government come and com government go, pushing for good governance, um, also, again, I'll just ask you almost the same question I asked Shehu. Um, if you are looking at the antecedents of this man and how he got here, um, because Shehu talked about him being creative and, you know, coming up with the best ideas on how to deal with issues. Does he look like, does he seem like he will be creative? Will, will he care about it? Because I remember talking to the secretary of the, um, the Northern Elders Forum at some time about President Buhari, and he said that President Buhari was only ambitious and wanted to be the president, but was not 
ambitious um, as to leading Nigeria uh, to a better place. So do you see Ebola Ahmed Tinubu wanting to just be a president or wanting to change Nigeria and leaving that legacy uh, for posterity to remember him quickly? Well, I think very quickly, you know, the person of Bola Metinobu is, a, is, an, is an enigma, is an intriguing mind, right? He's, he's very intelligent, he's deep. So I do not foresee a situation where you're going to have, you know, an armchair president who just wants to be president, he's fulfilled his ambition, and that's just it for him. He's going to be very active, he's going to be trying a lot of things, he's going to try new ideas. The problem that I think he's going to have, you know, my brother has already said that he has a big job. You know, Nigeria is in tatters in every sector that you can talk about. Tough decisions are needed. The problem that this president elects when he becomes president will have is that he has a legitimacy issue. If you are going to deal with, if you are going to make tough decisions, you must have your people standing firmly behind you, believing in you, and supporting everything that you do. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, the outcome of the elections as announced by INEC, which is still con being contested heavily in court, is such that only 37% of the people that voted voted for him, which okay. means there is a 63% that do not want him as president. And those people are likely to resist everything he does every step of the way. So it's going to be a tough job. I don't envy him at all. Oh, well, uh, May 29 is just around the corner. We'll be uh, counting down to that and, of course, watching to see what happens. Shea Musa Gabam is the national chairman of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, and Shagun Chopitan is a public affairs analyst, and he's also of ACT Network. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for having this conversation with me. Thank you. All right, we'll take a short break now, and then we will be discussing the calls for regional autonomy in Nigeria. Stay with us.